We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that we really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrix. Joining me today is Martin Armstrong from armstrongeconomics.com. He's a hedge fund manager, self-taught economist, and forecaster, and also the author of the newly released book titled The Cycle of War and the Coronavirus. How are you today, Martin? Oh, very good. Thank you for inviting me. It's great to have you on the program. I've been looking forward to speaking with you for a long time. So maybe we could start by... Um, having you explain a little bit about your background and about Prometheus for us, please. Uh, <clears throat> largely that um, my father originally wanted me to be a, a lawyer, but I didn't particularly care for it so much. So he sort of pushed me off into uh, computer science. So then I went through programming and electrical engineering and all that. Um, but I really always was a trader. I liked trading. And so then um, <clears throat> Back in the 70s, when I really went back to trading, I realized what I could write a, a program to actually do a lot of the things that I wanted to do. And so uh, Socrates is, has emerged from that. It's been uh, largely, we became the largest in the world as a financial advisor, mainly because of foreign exchange. Uh, so we just went to the floating exchange rate system in 71. Um, many schools still don't even teach anything. I mean, I've been asked to, to teach economics in, in, in three of the largest universities in Europe. And, and I was really kind of shocked at that. And I asked them why. And they said, well, because we no actually said to me, we know what we teach doesn't work. Um, mainly because you're still teaching economic theories of Keynes and stuff like that. And just look at what's happened. You've had quantitative easing, negative rates since in Europe since 2014. It's still failed to, to stimulate the economy, has not created inflation. Um, and so all the old economic theories have gone out the window. Um, they don't know what they're doing anymore. Um, and it's, it's just like, well, we'll try this. We'll try that. You know, it's kind of like uh, you have a headache. So, well, let's cut off the left ear. Maybe that will help. Oh, that didn't work. Let's try cutting off the right one. You know, they just keep cutting off body parts. And so, oh, well, you know, patient's dead. Oh, now he's, now he's at rest, you know. Um, but so uh, it was really foreign exchange that uh, <clears throat> made us, you know, really the largest around because we were really the only people that were doing it. Uh, and uh, actually, I had when we were going to open our first office in Europe back in, in 85, um, I met with one of our clients who was the head of one of the, the top Swiss banks. And I had a, a bunch of names like European advisors or whatever. And because um, I figured they were kind of anti-American. So I thought we'd use a European name. And he, he asked me, he says, name one European analyst. And, and I was embarrassed because I couldn't. And he said to me, there are none. He says, that's why everybody uses you. And I said, why? And he explained to me something very important. He said, if he's British, it's always God save the queen, the French, Viva le Franc, et cetera. And mainly because after World War II, uh, the currencies were starting from zero. So the politician would say, oh, the Deutsche Mark's up two cents against the dollar. See, I've done a good job. So they use the currency as a political uh, validation of, of you know, being a good you know, premier or whatever, whereas that's not the case you know, in North America. I mean, nobody would ever vote for a president to say, well, hey, the dollar's up against the Mexican peso or something. Everybody go, yeah, so what? You know? But in Europe, it was different because you're starting from zero. So uh, even today... There is no real analyst in any of the major banks that could possibly stand up and say, hey, you know, the euro is going to crash. It's going to be, you know, they would be fired in a second. 
So in Europe, you have that problem. Even Estonia, when there was an economist that came out in 07, said the market's going to crash and the economy is going to go down. They put them in jail for six months. <laughs> you know? um, so you can't, you, you talk about the censorship here. Uh, so at that meeting, he said, no, you bring your American name. And he said, <clears throat> He says, the reason, quote unquote, he says, everybody uses you is because you don't give a shit if the dollar goes up or down. And when I thought about what he was actually saying, then I understood why we ended up where we were, because in Europe is always political. You couldn't come out. Um, and even in the 87 crash, uh, Merrill Lynch had taken a big ad showing all their analysts around a board table. And then they were saying that we're bullish on bonds. And I knew some of them. And I, I called. I said, what are you talking about? The bond market's going down. They said, yeah, but the lawyers basically came in and said, if we tell them to buy bonds and they lose money, we can't get sued. We have faith in the U.S. government. But if you tell them to buy IBM and IBM went down, then you're the professional and you should have known. <laughs> uh, so it, you have to understand what goes on behind the, the curtain here. It's, uh, so that's how we kind of emerged as we did. And we're all over the place. So when even like 97, when the Asian currency crisis hit, uh, we were the firm called in by the Chinese government. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, you know, I would actually help them become uh, capitalistic. I mean, some things you may sound very simplistic. I mean, but they took me to a, a facility where they were monitoring absolutely everything. And, but they were not interfering. The Russians would interfere. Uh, but the Chinese, it was, they took me in, they were showing me there was 249 varieties of tea. I had no idea there were that many. <laughs> and they were observing it and they couldn't understand why one tea would be like, say, a dollar in one place and three dollars in someplace else. And I said, well, where is it actually, you know, where's its origin? And they said, here. I said, well, first thing you have is transportation costs. And they go, oh, really? Yeah, you know, I mean, you have to understand in communism, if it's a dollar in one place, it was a dollar someplace else, even if it cost them five dollars to get it there. Mm -hmm. That's why communism failed. Um, so they were, I was impressed that they were just step, stepping back, observing, not interfering. And that's why China has boomed so much uh, and has become the second largest economy in the world compared to Russia, which had all the gold, you know, the diamonds and, and the oil, but they couldn't get off the ground because of the oligarchy. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's very interesting from an international perspective. Um, and that's what we bring to the table. Um, I was very interested in artificial intelligence uh, back in the early 70s, um, you know, just like Steve Jobs and, the, and the, a few of the rest of us back then. And um, so that's largely what I focused on. Uh, but most of what they call artificial intelligence today are just expert systems or they're built on, on uh, neural nets which have failed. Um, IBM's Watson, they thought, uh, would be able to, as a, basically a neural net, they, they thought it would be able to cure cancer and it failed. Um, uh, we didn't use that route because I more or less saw that was not an, an avenue to go down. So I created something completely different. Uh, and so the Socrates writes over a thousand reports every day, it covers every market around the world from Romania to uh, India and China, and we do all the Chinese stocks. Um, so it it's it, it's been used around the world uh, by so many institutions, investors, whatever. And it's not me basically putting out those forecasts. It's it's the computer. Yeah, it gives you kind of a an unbiased view um, based on its analysis, right, of of the inputs. Yeah, I, the most important aspect of it is, I mean, <clears throat> you can take 10 analysts. They might be good, but they don't cover everything. So the problem would be each one has their own methodology. 
So now you got to get used to how one guy does it, then the next guy, then the next guy. So what Socrates does, once you understand it, fine. It's the same analysis on the entire world. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't, if you understand, you look at, okay, fine, what it's forecasting, the timing array, you know what it means. So I can look at it on India, I can look at it in Romania, whatever uh, place in the world you want to look at. You, you already know how to use it. Mm -hmm. Martin, I'd like to move on a little bit to something um, I came across in my in my research for this interview. So could you explain to us the, the money cycle that we're in right now? Why hasn't all this money printing caused the hyperinflation that one would think it would? Like, how have the lockdowns caused most of the hoard savings and how the faith in government is really the key issue um, that will cause the inflation? And over what timeline um, will this loss of confidence be expected? Well, I mean, those theories of hyperinflation and, and things of that nature, they're um, great exaggerations. I mean, you, you, yes, you can look at Germany, but you have to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, in December of 22, they did a forced loan. So 10% of everybody's assets were seized and they issued bonds, which they eventually defaulted on, of course. Um, so once that happened, then you have the hyperinflation in 23. You've lost all confidence in the government. What, they just came and took 10% of everything I had? Can you imagine if you have your, pen, your pension fund and the government just came and said, we're taking 10% of it? If you suddenly would lose confidence in what is going on. Mm -hmm. that, that's the critical issue. Even when you know, we've put out studies on the Roman Empire, it fell actually in a very short period of time of only eight years. And it was the Roman emperor Valerian who was captured by the Persians. Um, it was the first emperor to actually be captured and they lacked the power to go get him. So once that happened, you can imagine uh, the people suddenly saw the Roman empire was vulnerable. Uh, they started hoarding money. I mean, then you get, into this hyperinflation period. And what that is about is that people hoard the older coinage, all right, which a uh, higher metal content. So as they hoard that, your money supply actually shrinks. So it forces the government to print more at a lower debased matter to keep, to try and keep its bills going. So that's how the debasement comes about. And now in, in paper money, in the case of Germany, they were just using it, buying anything tangible, art, land, whatever they could do, or converting it to a foreign, you know, a, a currency, France or whatever, uh, you know, just British pounds, anything other than German. So um, that's what creates the hyperinflation. It's the collapse in the confidence. We're still in this stage where we haven't reached that yet. Uh, if people uh, don't under don't believe in the future, that's the critical thing, and and that's why, I mean, we've published studies on interest rates. The stock market has never peaked with the same level of interest rates twice in history. Why? Because it's it's really the perception of the future. If you think the stock market will double next year, you'll pay ten percent, twenty percent interest. OK, but if you don't think it's going even going to go up one percent, you won't pay one percent. So it, it's it's the expectation um, of what's going to come, not the level of interest rates that really matters. So we have negative interest rates. It's very nice. OK, it doesn't stimulate anything. They went negative to try and force people to spend. So what did they do in Europe? The number one thing that they were buying were safes. Um, the Swiss were printing thousand Swiss, you know, Swiss franc notes, like going out of style. And people have been hoarding cash. That's why the ECB has been leading this charge to go to digital currency. Mm -hmm. If they can eliminate physical money, then they can't hoard anymore. That's their idea. And will force them to spend. Um, but what they don't realize is that in doing so, you're going to really undermine the confidence in government, period. And when that happens, 
everything goes. Um, I mean, it's it's not just the the whole issue of, of like in Germany, you don't trust the politicians. Uh, you're sooner rather see them hanging from a, a, you know, a light post than anything else. I mean, you know, you're, you're playing with fire at this point. Um, and that's why the, our computer has been showing nothing but rising civil unrest. Mm-hmm. Um, so is, is, is the cancel cancellation of currency issue um, in, in Europe, going to become a, a bigger issue coming into this into this next year and maybe explain to us how that might drive demand for the US dollar. Well, the dollar has never been canceled. So if you have a, a bill from 1861, a $5 bill, you can still spend it. Of course, it's worth a few thousand dollars to a collector. But, um, you know, in Europe, they routinely cancel the currencies and they've been doing this since, you know, World War Two. I mean, um, a 10 pound note from even, you know, 15 years ago isn't valid anymore uh, in Britain. I mean, so they've routinely been canceling currencies all the time. So Europeans are used to that. Uh, And this is also why the dollar is the reserve currency because 70% of the paper dollars are all outside the country. They use it as a hedge because the US has never canceled Whereas um, the old hundred dollar bill is still valid as the new hundred dollar bill. Uh, but in Europe, you don't have that luxury. So how can you hoard cash if they then cancel it? You then have to take it out of the safe, go down there and they go, oh, well, where'd you get this? Uh, 50% of it's ours for taxes or something, you know? And so it, it, it's fairly significant. And uh, <clears throat> the, the real push in this election, people think it's been really Trump versus Biden, and it's not. It, it's Trump versus basically uh, this Agenda 2030 coming out of uh, the UN and, and the World Economic Forum. And um, the Democrats tried putting in to digitize the dollar, Trump took it out uh, in the st- last stimulus package. So. <clears throat> They were trying to get the U.S. to follow that agenda, and the Democrats were were happy to accommodate that. So, you know, that's been the pressure in saying that if the U.S. does this, then we cut off all their avenues and we get our tax revenue. That's that's the way they look at it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I I don't think you're going to find it so easily in the United States, even if Biden does become president. Um, you're going to find an awful lot of, of civil unrest. It's only going to set it up dramatically. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, these people think that eliminating the currency, you also eliminate the underground economy and all you know illegal things like from drugs and prostitution or whatever. You know, um, <clears throat> I mean that is a sizable part of the economy. I mean there are a lot. I mean. It's not just like you know, prostitutes and drug dealers. I mean, you know, you're going to hire uh, the next door neighbor girl to watch the kids. You know, uh, does she take Visa or MasterCard? No, you give her some cash, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, so you're talking about the cash economy. It's not just illegal. It's, it's, it's you know, a tip. You know, you're giving, you know, a bellman or something. And so there's no more tips. Um, I mean, it, it's a profound change to the economy all the way around. Mm-hmm. I mean, waitresses don't earn that much money because they work on the tips. So, okay, fine. If, if you're eliminating cash tips or whatever, you're changing a substantial part of the economy. Mm-hmm. Martin, I'd, I'd like to ask you why, like what your thoughts are, are around why the gold standard has never worked and, and the problems with pegging a currency to something like gold. Largely, you can't peg it against anything. Um, I mean, they've tried fixed exchange rates. I mean, even the uh, uh, Britain, when it, it, you know, when the pound, you know, Soros became famous, because they, you can't peg it, because you have a business cycle, and um, it, it sometimes we're booming and sometimes we're we're not, and and other it's not necessarily that everybody's even booming and busting at the same time. Uh, so uh, you can't fix it. 
and then at the same time say, oh, okay, fine, I should be getting wage increases every year. Uh, you can't have inflation and fixing the, the currency. That's why Bretton Woods collapsed to begin with. Mm-hmm. Eventually, you get such a huge divergence between reality and the artificial fake, you know, exchange rate that it, it just busts. So it's not just gold. It's it's you can't peg currencies. I mean, you look at the Asian currency crisis was the same thing. They were all pegged and that broke. Um, I mean, I was named uh, foreign exchange analyst of the year because I had met with the Swiss, you know. Um, and I told them, look, the peg's going to go. You can't do this. And they said, oh, no, we think we're going to be able to to hold the peg against the euro. I said, well, I think the odds are on my side because nobody's ever won in, in history. And I think it was maybe about 30 to 60 days after that it broke. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they named me like uh, Forex, you know, it, uh forecaster of the year or something but i mean i mean i didn't you know it wasn't even necessarily something that i thought was uh, an earth-shattering forecast i thought it was just standard operating procedure i mean nobody's ever done it mm-hmm. um but to, to name me in that capacity kind of shows that people think that the government can do whatever it wants um like Bretton woods you know why would it break i mean the government said this is it and they're not infallible. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> you, you can't, I mean, the, the idea that you could fix gold to the dollar and then increase spending of dollars without any change to the ratio, I mean, a three-year-old would figure that out, I, I would think, with a pocket cal- you know, calculator. I mean, it, it's just absurd to come up with these ideas that there can be a gold standard. I mean, it's never worked because you can't peg anything. Mm-hmm. Um, mainly because the economy expands, it, it contracts. And <clears throat> I mean, in all fairness to Keynes, he advocated deficit spending only during a recession. And he also advocated saying you could also stimulate by lowering taxes, which they don't do. Okay, so uh, he never advocated you can have perpetual deficit spending forever. Um, But so that's not really Keynesian economics. That's just, you know, fiscal mismanagement. Mm -hmm. But you have all these, you know, academics uh, in economics that, um, and and why I was not really that interested was largely when I was in school, we went to physics, physics class. And the professor said that nothing's random. I mean, even Einstein said, I don't believe God plays dice with the universe. You know, um, <clears throat> then you went to economics class and I said, oh, everything's random. And uh, therefore, the business cycle, yeah, it exists, but nobody can really define it. Because they want to be able to advise, do this and we can manipulate this. We can create utopia, whatever. Uh, as long as it's random, then they theorize they can manipulate it. And so I said, wait a minute, what are you guys is lying? Go to physics class, nothing's random. You go to economics class, everything's random. So it, I, it was just, a, to me, it's just like hugely hypocritical between the two. Mm-hmm. So Martin, just to go back to something you were saying earlier about the, the German bonds, and then they eventually defaulted on them. Um, can you highlight for us where we are in the in the bond bubble in the U.S. and and how that might look going forward? The U.S. actually is is in the best shape. It's it's the what you would say is the prettiest of the three ugly sisters, as they <laughs> as they put it. Um, <clears throat> mainly because the U.S. also has the largest economy, uh, and you know people say, "Oh my God, is you know you're you know you're." going to be a $30 trillion deficit. Well, you know, when you start looking at it from that, on a sovereign debt basis, by the time U.S. hits 30, the rest of the governments will have exceeded 100 in total. Uh, so the U.S. is not the biggest, uh, and it has the biggest economy to facilitate it. Uh, the worst part is, is really in Europe, where they have... Uh, 
the, the problem we've emerged by lowering the interest rate to negative, and then the central bank has been buying everything, they can't now raise the rates. They're trapped. Mm -hmm. So this is part of this great reset. And what's really behind it, um, if you look at Klaus Schwab's little piece on his eight predictions for 2030, that which Trudeau has signed on to, uh, the first one is you will own, you know, um, you will own nothing and you'll be happy. Mm -hmm. What that is about is more than just communism per se. Um, it, they can't continue going at the way they are. So <clears throat> the proposal that uh, Schwab has been putting is that basically they should just default on all the debt. I've been arguing that they should at least um, go into a perpetual bond like the old British consuls and pay interest on it every year. And, and otherwise you wipe out all the pension funds and everything else is gone. Mm -hmm. um, Schwab has been saying basically a communistic approach and to default on all the debts. Now to cover up the fact that government can't pay, that comes in, oh, well, <clears throat> uh, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. And pitching it that we're gonna eliminate all your debts, your, your mortgage, your student loans, and, and you won't owe anything. You won't own anything, but you also won't owe anything. That's a cover because they are going to also say, well, now we don't owe anything. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think it's it's highly dangerous. And they this guaranteed basic income uh, is really to replace the pensions. Uh, so because most of these pension funds uh, even outside the United States have anywhere from 70 to 85% mandatory ownership of government bonds. You and U.S. So securities, 100% government bonds. So if the government defaults, there goes the entire social security system. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have people riding with pitchforks, you know, storming the White House at that stage. So how do you get out of that? That's where this guaranteed basic income comes in. So by saying uh, that, and, and you're already starting to see it there in Canada, like, okay, fine, you're going to lose your, your, your income, you're going to lose your job, but uh, we'll be there to give you a handout. And as long as you do what we tell you to do, you'll continue to get your money. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, it, you know, that's the danger of what they've been doing, because these lockdowns have been more devastating on class, the lower the class, um, the more they've been been hurt by this, uh, mainly because they can't work from home. Um, you know, they have to physically go do something, waitresses or whatever, um, cooks in the restaurant, uh, look at hospitality. I mean, it's been devastated. Uh, we just had a, a conference in Orlando um, at the Hilton there, I mean, Thanks to the governor, we could even hold it. I mean, I don't think we could have had a conference anywhere else. Uh, and the hotel was just so ecstatic that we were even there. <laughs> it was like, um, this is, it was held at Disneyland and normally the hotel was packed. We were the mm -hmm. only people there. Uh, they had a 5% occupancy rate. That was it. Mm -hmm. So, Martin, as, as you're talking about the, the Great Reset and the, the plan that uh, Klaus Schwab has for, let's say, 2030, do you have any um, any predictions or, or any models on if that's going to succeed and, and actually be implemented in, in places like Canada? Uh, no, look, it's, it's, um, it's pretty much the same thing as what Karl Marx did, thinking that he can actually change the entire economy. Uh, and this is what these lockdowns are about. It, it's uh, the first time you could attribute it to, okay, fine, the politicians were just stupid. They over-exaggerated. But to continue this nonsense, when the vast majority of people that are dying are the elderly, the average age is like 81, uh, there are no 
you know, uh, influenza cases anymore. Everything's COVID. Uh, and uh, out in the street, I mean, we're not talking about a, a serious pandemic. I mean, a, a Black Death was like 50% of the population died. I mean, there have been other ones that have been 10, 15% of the population. We're nowhere close to something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and nobody in history has ever shut down the economy. Yes, you quarantine those that are sick, not everybody. So this is, they've been using this coronavirus as the excuse to, to crush the economy. And, and um, if you look objectively, you'll see uh, Trudeau uses Build Back Better. You look, Biden has Build Back Better. You have uh, Johnson in, in England, Build Back Better. World Economic Forum, go to their site, Build Back Better. This is... <clears throat> Based upon what I believe, it's the marketing firm Edelman, who which is in partnership with Schwab, and they have offices around the world. This is a marketing campaign. When have you ever seen all the heads of state all with the same, you know, talking points? This is a global attempt. Um, so it's not. That's why I say it was not Trump versus Biden. Mm -hmm. uh, it'd be nice if it was that was just simply the case, but it's not. It, it's Trump versus, you know, Agenda 2030, basically. Um, and because it's a coordinated effort on a global scale. And and that's what is the problem. So these the Great Reset, I don't see this as being successful. It will fail. It's, it's ludicrous to come up with these ideas. They've never worked in history. Um, and they distort everything, you know, even you take the um, Black Lives Matter, it's a, they're the ones that instigated this. Mm -hmm. And then they're saying, you know, <clears throat> I mean, Klaus Schwab, you can Google it and you'll see that, oh, if we don't accept his uh, agenda, there are going to be revolutions. It's the opposite way. I mean, we're going to have revolutions because he's trying to do this mm -hmm. agenda. Um, and, oh, it, we have to seek equality. Well, you know, it's, it's, this is why they've been instigating class warfare. Um, and, but their problem is, is they think they can put it back in a bottle like a genie, you know, and they can't. Once they've unleashed this thing, it's only going to get worse. It's not going to get better. And I think civil unrest is something that that you guys are predicting, or or not you guys, but um, Socrates is predicting um, coming up a lot more in this in this next decade, right? Yeah, I mean, it started from 2014, and uh, the computer's been projecting that we have substantial rise in in civil unrest, which we're we're seeing everywhere in, in Europe. Uh, I mean, we have staff in Berlin and London and everywhere over there, and it, it's just amazing. I mean, Berlin is like the uh, one of the, the hot spots for, for protests. We're seeing the same thing in, in France, and I think uh, from a timing perspective, you may see more of a revolution first in France than you do in North America, um, mainly because the French already had the Yellow Vest movement to start. Mm -hmm. So this is only coming on top of it. Whereas we have to get to first stage um, and uh, we'll probably begin to see that, I would think April, May of next year. But when does this um, come to a major head? It looks like around 2022. Um, they do think that um, you, you, if you look at it, you'll see they're all starting to come out and talk about, oh, climate change, we have to do this. There is no possible way, and you can look at our site on, on this coming Sunday. I mean, we put a piece on there from one of the universities that have gone through and you know, looked at this. There's no possible way we could ever generate enough energy through batteries, uh, solar, uh, and wind to ever match what we what we have, mm -hmm. um, and is it you know to create enough batteries to store enough 
uh, energy that the, the United States would use even in a single day would take 500 years. Um, I mean, it, you look at California, they have rolling blackouts. They don't even have a power grid. How are you going to put everybody's cars on electric? Um, you know, but, you know, look, there's no qualifications to be a politician. That's our problem. You know? <laughs> so, Martin, I'd like to move on a little bit to talking about um, ways to protect ourselves in this this coming, um, let's say, chaotic decade. Um, maybe let's start by talking a little bit about how gold doesn't actually keep pace with inflation. Yeah, I mean, it's gold is more of a hedge against government. Mm-hmm. A, a misconception that it's a hedge against inflation. I mean, um, <clears throat> in, inflation is highly debatable, and it's Japan saw deflation. And then all of a sudden they were going to raise their retail sales tax. The month before everybody ran out and bought everything they ever dreamed of in a single month. And the economic statistics that month made it look like Japan suddenly recovered. Mm-hmm. Of course it went right back. <laughs> I mean, people aren't stupid. I mean, if they realize, all right, it's going to cost me 10% more next month than today, then I'll buy it today. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that is more or less the inflationary cycle. We have to get to the point where people lose that confidence in government. Now, there are a lot of people that are, are gold bugs, etc., and they say, oh, what are you talking about? That's your view. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about the average person that goes, stands in line at, at Starbucks and holds up their phone to, to buy, you know? They, you know, they're not in the same thinking process. So we're talking about the average person, not talking about the sophisticated investor per se, um, who, you know, the, the gold bugs will be able to say, oh, no, you know, gold is this. That's your view. Mm-hmm. We're talking about, you have to understand what the rest of the people are. And when they get to that, then it, it, it will spark. Okay. Um, so we haven't reached that yet. And I think part of this is um, this election debacle that we have. Um, and it's still up in the air. Is Trump really going to be in? Is he going to be out? I mean, it's a, still, it's a, it's a fight to the, to the death, really, at, at this stage. And um, either way, I mean, it doesn't matter. If he wins, the other side's going to revolt. If, if he loses, then his side's going to revolt. I mean, nobody's going to accept the outcome of this, and that's part of the civil unrest. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I would honestly say that for right now, you could probably still look at it's It's more on the tangible side, and it's not that you're going to make money. All right. The high in the P.E. ratio actually took place at the bottom in the stock market in 2009. Why? Because at that point, you have people were questioning whether banks were going to fail. Um, what was the future like in the economy? So at that stage, you're buying the blue chip stocks not to make money, just to park money. Mm-hmm. As long as I can get most of it back, I'm happy. OK, as opposed to putting cash in the bank and I don't know, are they going to survive or are they going to go belly up? Uh, so you're talking a, about parking money versus, gee, I'm going to buy because I think I'm going to make 10 percent next year. Uh, that's kind of a, a normal process that we've had in, in the idea up to this point. But now we're crossing into this area of questionable future. Uh, We have this real uh, political battle uh, and a lot of countries are just going to end up splitting over this. Um, You you look in in, even in Germany, it's north against south, Italy, north against south. Um, Pretty much everywhere you go, you're starting to see, I go to Spain, it's it's, it's Barcelona wants to get a a leave Madrid. In the United States, you know, you you had people saying, okay, fine, California, Oregon, and Washington will split if if Trump wins. And now you have people in Texas saying we're going to file for 
uh, a separatist movement, basically. You got the same thing going there on in Alberta. Um, you know, it's you, you can't have this, uh, I would say, this idea that as soon as one side gets control, then they get the right to oppress the other side. And, and that's wrong. I mean, even if the election with Biden is, is correct, you're talking about 50.4%. That's not a mandate. Uh, and so then you get to, to basically take access and, and hurt everybody else that's on the opposite side. Um, you, you're talking about that's what you start getting into revolutions. Uh, and, and, and they typically end up splitting um, often the way they were before. So in, in the United States, it would be maybe the South against the North. Um, <clears throat> California in that area wasn't part of it at that time, so they probably would join New England. So it might be the middle of the country in the South against the rest of them. Um, in Canada, uh, it would be more or less the West against the East. And, and these things go back. I mean, um, when they created the Federal Reserve, it was a bailout for the banks. That's why the banks ended up owning it, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, no taxpayer money was supposed to go in. Then World War I came and the, the Fed was supposed to stimulate by buying corporate paper. The government came and said, no, you only have to buy government paper now, forget the corporations. Then they never put it back. Then you end up with uh, Roosevelt coming in. Well, to sell his, his um, new deal, he usurps all the interest rates from all the, the branches and brings them into Washington. So uh, the same thing then begins happening in Canada. But when you raise interest rates in, in Toronto, because you had real estate speculation, you're putting farmers and miners in bankruptcy in, in Alberta. Mm -hmm. One size does, does not fit all. Um, and we understood that. And that's how why each of the branches of the Fed had different interest rates. They were all independent. It was to manage the domestic economy. We lost sight of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you do that, that's what creates the tensions. Um, for example, between in Canada, Alberta, and the West. Uh, it's like they don't pay attention to us. They don't listen to us. Now they're saying they want to this new green deal and, and, you know, fossil fuels and put Alberta in, in you know, in bankruptcy. So it, it's, you know, you can't have this sort of, of agenda where one side gets in and, and it, it's crazy. I mean, um, and I testified before Congress on this and I explained to them, I said, you know, you, you should not be able to constantly change the tax rate like a yo-yo. You know, a, a company's left, not simply because, oh, I can pay this guy only $10 instead of 15. Mm -hmm. That's not the issue. You, you're going to, it's like basically you sign a lease for a house or for an apartment. Would you sign a lease that says the landlord can change your rent and double it if he needs to because he lost some money gambling the next month? <laughs> uh, I mean, that's basically what it is. It, it's like <clears throat> businesses need stability. In Macedonia, a number of companies went to Macedonia. Why? Because they offered them 20 year tax guarantee deals. Um, and it's like, okay, fine, now I can build a plan. It doesn't matter if I'm paying you $10 or $15. It's the tax. Am I going to, what are the regulations? Are they going to be stable? Or are they, I, as soon as I sign this deal, you're going to change everything. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, like I said, you wouldn't sign a lease for an apartment if, if the landlord could change it every month. Mm -hmm. So Martin, do you have any um, considerations that maybe our listeners should think about um, as, as in ways to, let's say, um, capture some of the value of their, their assets um, that they currently would have to go into this, into this let's say, decade of, of uncertainty here? I don't think you're going to see anything that you could say 
buy this and we'll be okay for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. We're going to be on a cycle basically, I would say every two years. Um, The risk of uh, international war increases after 2024. Uh, And you have to understand this is that, again, the politicians don't understand and and neither the academics. Uh, They think, oh, okay, fine, U.S., it's got its nuclear power. This is what keeps peace. No, it's not. Um, as long as the U.S. was the biggest consumer market, that's what raised China from the ashes. They could sell things to America. All right. It's not the nuclear weapons that, that creates world peace. It's self-interest. You're not going to attack the hand that bite you know that feeds you. All right. Now, if you cut that off which is what Klaus Schwab is trying to do. If you don't sign up to our agenda, then, you know, we're going to basically boycott everything in Asia. Uh, And you even heard Biden say he's going to take the U.S. and and reassign it and join the U.N. and use the power to force China to comply. I mean, this is World War stuff. I mean, they don't even understand what makes things work. Uh, as long as the Germans could sell BMWs to, the, to Americans, they were happy. All right. You cut that off. And then it's like, hey, I lost everything. And it's those guys over there that did it. And they start pointing fingers at each other. Mm-hmm. It's the economy that makes everything work, not nuclear weapons or force of arms or anything else. So I would be very concerned after 2024 going into mainly primarily into 2027 about um, a, a, a serious issue of international war. And, and that's mainly because these people are deliberately destroying the economy. Uh, and they want to crush it down so they can build it back better, as they're saying. Uh, and you had Johnson come out and saying, oh, we're going to create training programs for, for people so that they can make the transition to the new economy. Uh, Nobody's ever done this in history. The Great Depression was that type of transition, but not everybody can make it. It was 40% agrarian, and then all of a sudden you're saying, okay, fine, you're gonna starve unless you become, uh, you you understand to work in a factory. Some could make the transition, some couldn't. Um, I had a friend who was a, a pilot during the Korean War. And he said the same thing, that when they came out with jets, a lot of guys couldn't fly them because it was suddenly you had to respond much quicker than you did in the prop. So not everybody can make these transitions. And only an academic would think, well, we just train them and they're all going to be, you know, we're not all sheep. We're not all the same. Uh, And this sounds nice on paper, but not, not realistic. And no government has ever orchestrated it to begin with. Mm -hmm. Communism 3.0 doesn't have a a better ring to it than any of the other versions, right? No, I mean, look, it's, we're all, you know, they don't get it, but, you know, there's an excellent movie I would recommend to, to watch it, Mr. Jones. And it's about how the New York Times back then too, I mean, you have the left press are always communistic. And they were covering up the fact that communism failed. And Stalin um, was stealing food from Ukraine and 7 million Ukrainians died because he took all the food from them. Why? Because when you confiscated all the wealth, you eliminated the farmers who knew how to plant, when to plant, and what to plant suddenly that decision became a bureaucratic decision. I mean, if you ever go down to, to you know, motor vehicles, you want these people making a decision when to, <laughs> to, to do anything? I mean, come on. Um, so that's why the starvation took place. Mm-hmm. It was the government that was making the, the basic decision when to plant. They didn't know what to plant and they weren't farmers. So the entire crops failed. And then to cover it up, that people were starving, he stole all the food from Ukraine. Uh, and, and this is the problem. I mean, and Schwab says, oh, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. 
Why? Because people like him are going to make the decisions about how the economy should function. I mean, it's going to be in the same exact position as Stalin. Mm-hmm. In fact, I had posted, I had a friend basically in Slovenia who wrote to me, who lived there, you know, during the communist era and said, that is nostalgia. We had more freedom under Stalin than we have today. Crazy times, Martin. Uh, do you have anything else to add as we wrap up here? No, I look, I just think that <clears throat> just be mindful that we're not in a a solid trend for 10 years. It's more of, of the government falling apart. Mm-hmm. And as that confidence declines, more and more people are going to be, you know, questioning what's going on. You're starting to see with the civil unrest with these lockdowns. And the more that begins to percolate up, uh, we're going to see. You know, I mean, I, I published, I have a memo from Germany already asking how do we postpone the elections next August using COVID. So isn't that implying they're going to keep it going? Uh, this is the excuse. <clears throat> and they're, they're looking at suspending elections. And that's also one of the eight points in uh, Schwab's uh, predictions for 2030. Um, We have to understand that when they created the United States, all right, the idea of democracy was seriously flawed. The Roman Senate, nobody actually voted for those people. They were the aristocrats. That's it. All right. So the people in the street never voted for them. It wasn't a representative government that we think it was. Um, They didn't understand that when they were doing this. So the idea of the United States and people actually voting for somebody were in a representative has never taken place before in history. So this is why you have these governments coming in and you even had John Kerry you can Google that when he was saying it at the uh, at Davos that <clears throat> Trump is a danger because he he appealed to the lowest denominations in society who should be ignored. <sighs> so we are the great unwashed, and this is their attitude. They want to go back to just the aristocratic rule as it was in Rome, and we have no right to vote. Well, scary, scary times, Martin. Um, if there's anybody that wants to check out more of your work, of course, it's available at armstrongeconomics.com and also Strong Economics uh, on Twitter. Um, and also the, the title of the book that just came out on Monday is The Cycle of War and the Coronavirus, The New Threat to World Peace and the Battle of the Billionaires. Martin, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.